Alec, you ready to take it away? I certainly am. I'm ready. I'm still seeing the carousel on my end, though, with the thank yous. But I will get going. Thank you for joining us today for AAF Omaha's Professional Development Program Ad Connect, Reaching Out. We've invited a diverse panel today and have planned topics to discuss. We want all attendees to feel free to voice questions through the Q&A function during this webinar. We are hosting this reaching out because we feel the need to continue the DE&I conversation with our industry professionals. Our last panel in February focused on the perspective of business professionals and their experiences with diversity in the workplace. Today, we will hear from business leaders in our community and how they are bringing DE&I in their businesses and organizations culture. I am Alec Ray, Managing Partner and Director of Sales and Marketing at Frost Media Group. I serve on the AAF Omaha Board of Directors and co-chair the membership committee with Paula Stinson, owner of Paula Presents. Grab your coffee or lunch and we'll get started with today's discussion in a few minutes. AAF Omaha has been serving and offering professional development programs, webinars, thought leaders, and fun activities for our members virtually throughout the pandemic. We've learned a lot along the way and we will continue to offer virtual programming in the coming months. AAF Omaha is the unifying voice for advertising throughout Nebraska. In July, the two local Nebraska chapters of the American Advertising Federation will merge to become AAF Nebraska. AAF offers an organization to educate, inspire, and bring inclusive sense of community to advertising professionals in our area so that we and future generations can continue to do the work that we love. Events like today's professional development programming are free to our members as a membership benefit. Since our last reaching out panel discussion, AAF Omaha has added a diversity, equity, and inclusion resources page to our website. This page can be reached at aafomaha.org forward slash resources. We hope these resources will be of value to our membership. We will open for Q&A towards the end of the discussion. Feel free to use the Q&A function with our questions during the discussion. Terry, Ann, and myself will watch the Q&A throughout the panel discussion, and we'll get to those at the end if there's time. Without further ado, let's welcome today's moderator, Tony Veland, the Director of Business Development for the AIM Institute. Tony is an Omaha native who is known for his past accomplishments in the sports arena as a former Nebraska Cornhuster Corn and Denver Bronco. Tony has experienced success at the highest levels, and he enjoys using his platform to encourage the next generation to be successful in life beyond the areas of athletics. The AIM Institute helps to accomplish this as they provide exposure to a growing technology industry that abounds in opportunity. With the mission being to increase the tech talent pipeline, the AIM Institute has created platforms for individuals of all ages to take advantage. Now I turn it over to Tony. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at AIM. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'm just an Omaha kid who loves to give back to the community. And fortunately for me, I've been able to find an organization that does just that for a lot of the individuals that grew up in situations like me. My role as the Director of Business Development is to share our programs and our platforms with community members and community partners and corporations to see if we can get more partners and more people to support our mission. And with that being said, I'm very happy to be here moderating today. Uh, but let's go ahead and get to it. So advertising creates direct connections between consumers and brands. And as we all know, is a critical component of marketing. AAF Omaha has invited me and our panelists today to offer insights as we continue to build an inclusive advertising community. Our panel will share their points of view and insights on ensuring diversity of age, ethnicity, gender, language, and ability and accessibility and we'll touch on authenticity and image choices and avoiding stereotypes and bias in marketing and advertising. When the word diversity is brought up, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Race, gender, probably religion. Diversity includes much more than these criteria, especially for the rising workforce of millennials. A recent study from Deloitte and the Billie Jean King Leadership Initiative found that when it comes to defining diversity and inclusion at work, millennials see the concept through a completely different lens. AAF Omaha's Community Outreach Committee worked this year with a team of volunteers orchestrating a number of diversity and inclusion projects led by board members Suzanne Kalinske, 
from RCG Advertising and Media, and Rod Coleman from Bozell. In August last year, the Advanced Omaha Fund was formed, an initiative focused at closing the diversity hiring gap, starting with our very own marketing and advertising communities here in Nebraska. In an effort to support a more diverse group of creatives, marketers, and developers, and youth in Omaha, AAF Omaha created the Advanced Omaha Fund with 11 Omaha and Lincoln agencies contributing more than $28,000. These donations went directly to the four following local organizations. The Culture House, a hub that provides artists and creatives a safe space to grow their talent and obtain access to resources necessary to turn their art into economic opportunities. 75 North Code Camp, a coding camp primarily for high schoolers in North Omaha. Noise, a community-led news organization that addresses the information gap within North Omaha. And IB Black Girl, a collective that creates space for Black identifying women and girls to access their full potential to authentically be. While the fund is now complete, AAF Omaha's efforts are ongoing in partnership with these four nonprofits through our Diversity and Inclusion Committee. The AAF Omaha team assembled today's panel with thought leaders from diverse industries that are supporting and encouraging equity and inclusion. We only have an hour or so, and so we're gonna continue the conversation from the reaching out discussion in February to share ideas to help our industry take steps to help stop racism, gender bias, and give advice on how advertising and marketing professionals can better support diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in our communities through our work, relationships, and actions. Today, we have with us Dan Hart, diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist with Mutual of Omaha. Born and raised here in Omaha and an alumnus of Northwest Missouri State University, Dan is embracing his passion while cultivating an impact through diversity and inclusion and employee resource groups at Mutual of Omaha. His responsibilities include supporting the overall DNI strategy, analytics, and marketing, while governing all nine of the employee resource groups, operations, and activities at Mutual of Omaha. Dan, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Mutual. Thanks, Tony. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Harm. Pronouns are he, him, his. And um, I am a proud gay man living in Omaha, Nebraska, born and raised. As you know, my bio said, it's pretty straightforward. But within my role at Mutual, I am very proud and honored to be living out my passions, helping our employee resource groups really thrive and add value to not only our associates, but add value back into our business and give back to our customers. It's definitely a whirlwind, but it's fun times. I agree, awesome, thanks Dan. Next we have Natalie Hadley. Natalie is the Vice President of Outlook Business Solutions. She considers this her dream job helping companies understand what's holding back their growth, then matching those needs with a team of more than 25 skilled professionals who happen to be visually impaired. The company currently specializes in marketing, digital accessibility, and customer care, but regularly adds new team members with talents and skills in unexpected areas. Natalie, tell us a little bit about yourself and Outlook Business Solutions. Thanks, Tony. So I am also a native Nebraskan, graduate of Wayne State College with my bachelor's and got my master's at UNO in mass communications and um, went on and spent some years at Midlands Business Journal. Some of you may remember me as a, as a reporter there in the early 90s. Um, spent 25 years in the advertising, in the financial services space, and then joined Outlook in 2018. Um, Outlook is a social enterprise, and we address the social issue of the unemployment rate among the blind and visually impaired, which is about 60% um, unemployment. Um, so Outlook Business Solutions is part of the Outlook Collaborative that includes Outlook Nebraska. Many of you may be familiar with that sister entity as being a manufacturer of tissue and towel products um, by the blind for the federal government. Outlook Business Solutions was created to um, create more knowledge-based jobs for people who happen to be visually impaired. So we now have a group um, of professionals all over the country from copywriters to graphic artists to um, customer care agents um, and website accessibility testers all over the country. So it's a, it's a great job to, get, to go out and talk to businesses and find out what they need and then go find those awesome professionals who just happen to be visually impaired. 
and match those opportunities up. That's awesome, Natalie. Can't wait to hear even more about what you guys are doing. Uh, next in line, we have Kim Geyer. Kim is the executive director of the Creative Center, College of Art and Design in Omaha, where she is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the college. Responsibilities include, among many other things, oversight of the career services department and the placement of graduates just leaving college. Kim, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your role has been like at the Creative Center preparing for the next generation of advertising professionals. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, yes, my name is Kim Geyer. I have worked at the Creative Center for the last 27 years, the last 17 of those of which I've been the executive director. And during that time, there's been a lot of change in the advertising industry, as I'm sure you guys know. So preparing our students for employment is very much like chasing rainbows. The pot of gold keeps moving around and we have to keep coming up with new strategies to not only find it, but then access it once we find it. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, we have Johnny Lee. Johnny is currently working for the American Outlaws as a brand manager, a nonprofit US soccer supporters organization. It's a passing job with Johnny's primary role in sports and event marketing, brand management, and occasional loud noises, okay? It's a lot of yelling and screaming from the stands to support the USA. Johnny's role includes helping AO's charitable arm, AO Impact, to mobilize 20,000 members to serve in our community. Johnny teaches art direction at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and serves the community as a volunteer with numerous nonprofits, including Common Goal, the Anti-Racist Project, EPIC, the Bay, and Football for the World. Johnny, welcome, and please share a little bit about yourself and what it's like to follow your passion in sports marketing. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful to AF Omaha for putting such a great platform here uh, together today. I've been serving the youth sports uh, community for several years now as a volunteer coach, as a referee. I've been on the field a lot. I had my own nonprofit a while back called Onyx, which our biggest claim to fame was to host a street soccer tournament in downtown Lincoln, which raised money and awareness for the Special Olympics. So I think what that's what's great about soccer. It's a great unifier. And what's amazing is soccer is played worldwide by people of diverse backgrounds. And it's amazing that now I get to do that full time and pair it with my love for marketing and advertising with the American Outlaws, uh, because we are, we are really about like supporting US, US soccer, but also committed to a uh, welcoming and inclusive and accessible atmosphere at all of our games and our events that we put on for that. Um, and we, we work a lot to mobilize the 20,000 members we have worldwide and 200 chapters that represent us worldwide as well. So I'm happy to be here today and, and this is something that I'm really passionate about. So thank you. That's awesome, Johnny. I have to admit that I'll probably connect with you a little bit because I have a daughter that is playing professional soccer over in Sweden right now. So, you know, soccer has almost been my life for about the last 10 years. So oh, very yes. happy for what you do. Awesome. Well, again, we're, we're so thankful for our panelists to be here. And let's, let's get started on some of these questions. I think it's going to be a very exciting, exciting segment. So embracing diversity means redefining it with the organization and perceiving it as an essential element to innovation. Diverse thoughts are contagious and add significant value to the ideation process for any corporation. Today, successful businesses create an environment that includes diverse ways of thinking. Diverse ideas often stem from diverse minds. And these resources describe the impact on marketing campaigns. The study mentioned earlier, done by Deloitte and the Billie Jean King Leadership Initiative, found that millennials, who will comprise nearly 75% of the workforce by 2025, define diversity as a blending of different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives, or what scientists are calling cognitive diversity. This is defined as the differences in our thought and problem-solving processes, and millennials tend to view it as a necessary element for innovation. Dan, share with us why cultivating a culture so that everyone brings their best selves to work is not only the right thing to do, but also better for business. Sure thing. Actually, I think you all kind of answered it right there in your nice little description is mm -hmm. bringing those different perspectives and the diversity of thought into the room as well to the table and expanding that table and actually adding more seats and bringing that collective mindset is 
engaging more innovation to occur. With that being said, with only the input of many different perspectives in a business is able to actually forge and broaden not only to their world, not only to their associates and colleagues and coworkers, but in essentially their customers. And as you look at your customer base, it's going to diversify over the years. It's not just that one streamlined and not everyone can basically buy the same thing or are interested in the same thing. I'm 30, yeah, I'm 32. Sorry, just had a birthday. So yeah, I'm figuring out how old I am, but I'm 32. So trying to figure out what attracts me to actually a product versus what attracts my mom or what attracts my cousin or what attracts my best friend from work. And everyone's different thought and different way of thinking is going to add into that innovation and really embrace how a business wants to actually outreach them as well as looking into where they live. So I think it comes into that bringing that innovation so it can grow and thrive. That's going to be what able to bring your best self to work so you can bring that perspective and feel comfortable and feel able to actually speak up and feeling valued and heard is definitely going to not only be best for that associate, but best for the company in the long run. Interesting, very interesting. Can you tell us where DEI inclusion efforts start an organization and, and kind of what are some of the key components that you've encountered while internalizing this process? Sure thing. I think um, a lot of individuals, I'm not, I don't want to assume, I hate assuming anything because you know the old saying is when you assume, not going to get a finish it. But I think uh, a lot of people will think, okay, DNI, it's going to be more seen as a check off the box list. Okay, we have diversity, equity, inclusion. Great, let's move forward. Like, no, we got to kind of take a step back because a lot of people see DEI. It's another acronym. If you're in a big corporations like me, we love our acronyms. So I'm just going to say DEI. It's going to be house and HR since those are the people functions and how we are attracting our people. How are we attracting talent? But if you actually look into diverse equity and inclusion, it could be different spaces within your business. It could be, hey, and especially within your marketing segment, your talent attractions, your IT, you're going to have that innovation and diversity of thought and different mindsets bringing to it. So where it's usually housed, it's kind of probably in HR or different functions and seeing other people actually have their diversity, equity, inclusion housed in their marketing. But I think it all begins within leadership. You need to have that leadership support and buy-in so they actually know the importance of it and how they want to downcast that message. Because, you know, I could send out an email to all 5,000 associates at Mutual Loam Hall, but I bet probably 25% is actually going to read my email. But if we had our CEO, James Blackledge, send out an email, you know, people are going to most likely actually read into it and be more curious to see what he has to say. And I'm proud to say that James Blackledge, our CEO, has signed the pledge for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Know that it's a statement of how we can make a bigger impact for our associates moving ahead. That's awesome. So it's, when you're thinking about putting this together, who should all be involved? Obviously, you want leadership involved, but who else are our key members of, of any diversity task forces that you guys put together? Well, some individuals may think like, oh, we need, uh, we need a gay person. Hi, how are you? We need a black person. We need an Asian person. We need this. I think it comes down to actually finding those people who are very passionate because when you have that passion, you can thrive into making it a purpose for it. Mm -hmm. So you should have that solid foundation to aligning your best people of, okay, where is diverse equity inclusion going to be housed in? Start there and then start expanding out of what key components and individuals want to actually raise their hand to do more thus actually equipping them to work on not only their own development, but helping your culture really thrive and expand that message across the enterprise or across your audience of what you want to reach out to. I think it comes down to rather than being told what to do, it's then be nice to actually have those people who are raising their hand and really passionate who want to make a bigger impact versus actually just giving another, you know, another assigned as duties necessary on the job description. You don't want to be like, okay, we need this, this, and this. Well, that wasn't part of my job description. I think if you are actually implying and actually enabling people to be passionate about it, that's where you're really going to see momentum and change. Because when you see someone talk about something that they're so passionate about, you can see the light and the smile into their face versus someone rolling their eyes and be like, okay, well, I'm not going to take this person seriously now. They don't even want to talk about it. I think that passion really leads into change. I completely agree with that. I'm going to loop some of the some of the other panelists in, whether or not Dali or Johnny want to join as well. One thing I, I wanted to ask, I know that as we put these programs together, we have to think about what does success look like? How do, how do you guys measure you know, the progress with your programs? Feel free any of you guys to answer. I'm sorry. 
So for Outlook, I mean, we serve the blind and visually impaired. So that diversity, equity, and inclusion is baked in really from the, the mission forward. So it's never been an afterthought for us. I think um, Dan made a really good point about avoiding the tokenism. Um, and, and I love the be the change you wanna see in the world. So those of us who are passionate about this um, need to take that leadership position and need to make sure that we're bringing all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion to the organization and not just the one that we identify with. So um, so for me, I have a son who's 25 who has intellectual and developmental disabilities. So disability was really close to my heart and part of the reasons that I, reason that I joined Outlook. But we can't look at our diversity, our DEI programs as just being about disability, right? We have to look at it from the spe other perspectives of gender, of race, of age, and of sexual orientation. <clears throat> so I say, I think sometimes it's easy, like Dan referred to, as, let's let's find a gay person, let's find a black person, let's find an Asian person. We got to have a woman, and um, do we have anybody that's in a wheelchair? And um, that's really not what what it's about. It's about finding the people who are passionate and bring that into the culture. Great answer. And I, uh, and I agree with that as well. And it, and it kind of reminds me of the question that I talked about earlier. What do you think about when, you know, you say diversity? Because I'll be honest, I do think about, you know, race. I do think about gender, but there are a lot of times where disabled individuals are kind of an afterthought. And so we really need to kind of broaden our minds and our, and our scopes to really include those individuals as well. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear what you guys are doing there. Okay, so let's go to the, the next question. Um, in, an education, in an educational setting, can you tell us about the teaching opportunities students are receiving in the classroom about inclusive marketing and diversity in advertising? On the business level, de and I programs and culture start at the top in the C-suite. In your opinion, are students coming out of higher education institutions with the knowledge to bring more diversity to the industry they will soon be part of? This question is for Kim. Thanks, Tony. Um, I think the fact that we're you know, even talking about diversity is a, is a huge stride. 20 years ago, you'd have a student working on an assignment and they want to allude to anything uh, LGBTQ and it, the teacher's like, are you sure you wanna be that controversial? Right. And now today it's like, wow, that's great diversity. Let's make sure to get that in there. So we've made great strides in that respect. Um, and the fact that the conversation is being accepted in the classroom is the first start, because then students have a better chance and a better um, willingness to bring it up once they are in a business environment. Um, having said that, that confidence can disappear really, really quickly if they go to work in an environment where, which is not open and accepting. And so that's where there's this transition. It's very easy to live in our own little bubble. Um, years ago, we at I attended a meeting for the um, Business Ethics Alliance and the topic was on business dress. You know, what's required? Is that appropriate? Should we wear a suit to work every day? That kind of thing. And there were banks there and the, the guy from Jimmy John's was one of the panelists. And, um, and I was struck by how many companies still require uh, formal dress because I live in my own little bubble. I work at the Creative Center, which we don't care if our students have purple hair, they're covered in tattoos and piercings. We don't care as long as you can do the work that's what we care about. Um, but that little bubble, that's what it is. And so the students in that bubble have to adjust to that as well so that when they get out into uh, the working environment, into the industry, there are still companies that require women to wear pantyhose uh, to work every day. Uh, and you need to know that going in. And that's part of, yes, it's part of what, the, what research you need to do as you're looking for a job, uh, but it also can come as quite a shock when you've been living in an environment that is completely accepting of who you are, how you dress, what you look like, and it doesn't matter. And now all of a sudden I have to think about it. I have to think about, do I have to cover my tattoos? Where are my tattoos? How many piercings do I have in my ears or in my nose or in my eyebrows? That all becomes critical. And, and that's, I think, where that adjustment 
comes into play. So, so starting in the classroom is great. Um, and I think we've made huge strides in that regard. Um, I, speaking from the Creative Center's point of view, uh, but it is just a start. We can do as much as we can do, but then once we, you know, free our little birds into the air and they go off and they go into to work in the in the industry, um, a lot of them get really discouraged and they get they get really disappointed. Um, and part of it's because you know they're dealing with their own imposter syndrome. They're dealing with their own um, nervousness and they're, you know, they're low man on the totem pole. So they don't want to make a lot of noise. They don't want to, they don't want to cause a lot of ripples. Um, and I think that lends itself to the companies really needing to encourage these kinds of discussions daily, regularly, and not just during diversity training, but on a regular basis so that people feel comfortable all the time bringing up topics that are close to their heart. No, that's a, that's a, a very excellent point. And as you say that within your work, do you see businesses become more accepting of the individuals, even though there's, you know, differences now, or do you see it still kind of staying a little bit more traditional? I do have to say that as, as I've been in this industry and as I've been teaching the kids and as I've been watching them go work at different places, I think there's been a, a big movement towards diversity and inclusion for sure. Um, there's still the old holdouts. There's still those companies that, that think that their client base is not going to be accepting um, of, the, of certain kinds of diversity. And so they're gonna hold out as long as they possibly can and they're still out there. But a lot of the younger companies that are coming up, I really see um, not, not just that they are di more diverse, we've been diverse forever, just people don't talk about it. So it's the fact that they're talking about it, that they put it on their website, that they wanna put pictures of you know, everybody that works in the office or that they wanna talk about what they do or who they are or what they're passionate about that does nothing to do with the job that they do. Um, and that, that's helpful because that, that builds the culture of the company and helps people looking for a job try to match that culture with something that's going to match their personality. That's awesome. So when you're, when you're actually looking for opportunities for some of the students that you're trying to place, are these young professionals, are, are they concerned about the DE&I programs? I mean, are they just thinking about the almighty dollar? Or are they just like, hey, they, people, companies have got to give with the times. They got to be thinking about these times. So if that, are those cultures, are those values important to the young individuals that you're actually working with? Right. Well, uh, first, let me say that job hunting uh, is a slog. It's, it's mentally and emotionally exhausting. It's a lot of rejection and not a lot of positive reinforcement. It's a tough thing to do. And so, yes, they, students, um, and speaking from personal experience, you can start out thinking, all right, I'm going to find the best job for me. I'm going to find what I'm passionate about. I'm going to find this company that's going to love me for who I am. I'm going to find a position that is going to be exactly what I want to do. And that's my focus. And then that lasts until you get, you know, 47 rejections of all those, those uh, job descriptions that you thought were going to be perfect. And they just keep coming with no, uh, uh, no feedback no critique, no reason why, just nope, you didn't even get to the interview stage. So the students deal with this all the time. And a lot of times they're applying to things blind, meaning they're giving their name, their contact information, their resume, maybe a cover letter if they're lucky. That's it. That's all that they get to submit. Bam, they give it to them and then they just wait. Okay. Yes, you're supposed to follow up. Yes, you're supposed to bug the HR. Yes, you're supposed to do all this stuff. I guarantee that most students don't do that. Okay. And so that's, it's really, really frustrating. So yes, students can start out really looking at diversion and inclusivity and they're really passionate about that. There's going to become a point if they don't get what they want right away, there's going to become a point where they just need a job, okay? And again, that puts the honest back on the company. Companies need to know that, that they need to provide these kinds of, um, cultures, these kinds of environments that are accepting. Um, now, at the Creative Center, we've tried to overcome some of this uh, lack of knowledge, you know, the lack of students don't know what they're getting into, they don't know what companies are all about. 
Um, and we bring in just a ton of guest speakers and tours. So by the time students graduate after three years, they get their bachelor degree and they've met between 50 to 75 professionals in the industry, okay? The reason behind that, obviously networking, we wanna get their name out. We wanna get people's in the industry names in the creative center so students can meet them. But it also really gives the students a chance to compare. Look at how, look at the people who work at this company, how they act, um, how, what they talked about, what kind of projects they work on. And now look at the people at this company, how, how they act, what they work on, you know, and, and lets them see personally and intimately where, what different companies look like. Um, what does an agency look like versus what does an in-house company look like versus uh, what does a sign company look like versus what is a design studio look like versus what is a web house? I mean, there's all these different choices and the students don't, they don't, you know, I've been in the industry long enough that, yeah, it's second nature. I know what all these things are. They don't have a clue. So we need to, as, as educators, that's part of the education process. We need to educate them on what's available in the industry, what's out there and what they need to look for. Um, now, students do look at a company's culture. They try to garner as much information as they can about the company, but most companies' websites are set up to gain clients, not employees. So they don't talk about their culture a lot. Now, again, not all, but a lot of companies out there, they're not, their websites are not geared towards, look how great we are, look how inclusive we are, come work for us. They're geared towards hire us so that we can make money. Okay, that's just the name of the game. That's, that's the world we live in. So it's very difficult for students to figure out where they wanna go and what kind of culture that company has unless they're very explicit about it, which every once in a while you'll come up against a website and they that company's all over it. They know that they wanna hire uh, maybe a younger uh, a generation of students that they want to, they, they have the information out there that those people are looking for. They've done their research. They know who their target market is, right? And <clears throat> some of those companies, yeah, they're going to get a lot of applications. Um, the other companies out there, the holdouts who still require pantyhose, they're going to get a lot less applications because students are going to make their own um, decisions and their own connections. And they're going to make a lot of assumptions based on you know, dress code based on other things that may or may not have anything to do with what the culture of that company is like. So <clears throat> I think that I think that some of that lands again on the company's shoulders. They need to start as they want to go on. They need to make sure that they have that information out there and available to people who may or may not want to work there to make sure that they're getting, they're gaining the employees that they want in that regard as well. Awesome. That's, that's, that's such great information because I know there's a lot of kids out there that they're really just looking for, unfortunately, just, just the pay, you know, not think, thinking about the culture and thinking about how that's going to allow them to be either successful or unsuccessful because they won't be happy in their job. So thank you for sharing that information. <clears throat> um, next, we're going we're gonna to pose this question to Natalie. Uh, Outlook Business Solutions is a business growth agency based in Omaha, specializing in marketing, customer care, and digital accessibility. Their team includes a network of more than 30 talented professionals, most of whom happen to be visually impaired. OBS is part of the Outlook family of communities, of companies, excuse me, focused on providing earning and enrichment opportunities to people with vision impairment. Natalie, Outlook's facility, excuse me, was designed specifically for, pe for people with visual impairment. What types of adaptations has Outlook made that other companies might adopt to create a more inclusive workspace? Tony, I'm, you know, disability is so often the overlooked part of the DE and I conversation. Um, we, we just, you don't see it as much. I saw a statistic the other day that of all the articles being written about DE and I, only 3% mentioned disability as part of that conversation. Um, and, and ironically, disability is actually the minority group that like it or not, any of us could end up joining at any time. So only 15% of people with disabilities were born that way. And of the 20 year olds out there today going through Kim's programs and other and selecting their employers, uh, one in four are going to end up disabled before they reach retirement age. So it's really an important part of the conversation, but it's so often overlooked. 
So Outlook um, has a facility on 72nd and F um, there, where we've been for about, I think, 15 years. It's the old Crown Cork and Seal building for those who know Omaha well. And in 2017, we underwent a pretty significant remodel of our um, office and visitor space. Um, we do have a, the manufacturing plant in, in this location. And so some of the things that have been adapted out in that environment for people with um, visual disabilities are um, alerts and, and notifications and things that come from this, all this large equipment. So um, some of the equipment is, is dangerous. Um, we have huge saws that um, cut up your roll of toilet paper you know, we don't we don't wind them all up in little bitty pieces like that. Um, so it's important that all the safety controls, whereas um, for a sighted person, you might have a green light that turns red or you might have something that flashes to indicate that there's a danger or that something has malfunctioned with the equipment. Our equipment has been modified to actually give an audio alert. So there is a little snippet of voice recording and there um, the machine is programmed that instead of just flashing the lights, it also needs to um, play this audio clip that says, you know, um, area C is jammed, you know, remove the jam or whatever the case may be. But looking in the, in the other spaces besides the actual heavy equipment manufacturing space, we did things like um, high contrast flooring. So when you come into Outlook, if you're walking down the hallway, you'll notice that along that the floor may be a light gray and along the walls there may be um, a strip of black and that that black will end at a doorway and turn gray and that's to notify someone who's um, low vision that um, they have encountered a doorway where there may be somebody coming out of the door we also have textured floors for people using canes so that when they reach a doorway or an intersection of hallways the texture of the flooring changes to give them an alert that again, there may be cross traffic in that particular spot. Our vending machines are kind of one of the fun things to show to visitors. So all of our vending machines and our microwaves talk. So um, you can actually go to the vending machine and push the button and it will start reading to you your selections. So, you know, A1, Diet Pepsi, 16 ounce or whatever it might be. And then um, a lot of the um, monitors, and this is going back to the factory, but we have um, for people who are low vision, a lot of times they just need the text to be larger or the images to be larger. So we have a lot of 60 inch monitors out in the converting space instead of a regular computer monitor or even a very small monitor that you might see on a large piece of equipment. Ours are like jumbotron size so that um, people can read those from where they are without having to, to go all the way up to the monitor and get really close to see what's on them. The biggest challenge I think for our employees and for others with um, disabilities in the business environment is software. And um, as, as a marketing agency and a marketing professional, um, which is where all my background is, I'm you take for granted things like being able to use a marketing automation software, being able to use an email software, um, being able to use a survey software, um, CRM system, all those tools that, that we as able-bodied folks take for granted in a work environment can be a huge challenge for someone with a disability, particularly a visual disability where they're reliant on technology like screen reader software. So um, that's a big challenge even for Outlook Business Solutions itself is um, two out of our four full-time folks are blind, completely blind. And every time I go find a tool and I'm like, oh, you guys, this is such an awesome tool. This is gonna make the email better and we can see the open rates and we can see exactly who interacted with what aren't accessible because they're all built, the user interface is very, very visual, very graphic. So um, that's been the biggest challenge for, for us in the business state space. Adaptations like um, changing the flooring and those kind of things are pretty easy. Um, I, I'll just, one more that I'll throw out there and I'll actually throw a vendor name out there. If you're doing Zoom meetings and you wanna make that printed content accessible for people who um, are print disabled, um, you can actually, there's a, a bot called Scribe for Meetings, 
and you can sign up for an account and then um, you invite the bot to your Zoom meeting and it, anything that is shared on the screen, um, it will actually convert into an accessible format for your attendees who are visually impaired or print, what we call print disabled, right? Print doesn't work for them. So um, there are, are tools that are coming on the market that are the adaptive part for the person with the disability. The challenge is that the things those adaptive systems need to connect to aren't keeping up with it when it comes to accessibility. Well, you guys are doing quite a bit. Um, I mean, that's, that's awesome. I, I have to admit the only experience that I've really seen where people have made some type of adjustments is to have you know, someone, you know, some type of either coach or, or supervisor come help an individual as they're, they're trying to, to onboard them, but they don't do a lot of changes, you know, to the actual work environment and workspace. So, so what you guys- Yeah, and if, I mean, imagine, imagine as a professional in our own rights that to, um, to proofread the copy for a new ad, we had to have somebody come read it to us, right. character by character and each punctuation mark. Um, we would find that very demeaning and humiliating. And so I think when companies with all their good intentions think, oh, well, she can't read that, so we'll just bring somebody in to read it to her. Or they can't hear what the president is talking about in his speech, so we're going to give them a, a print copy of the script. Um, they, they have good intentions, but they don't realize that that's actually ableism. And, and it's not letting that person with a disability be independent and self-sufficient in, in their work environment. Such a great point. Such a great point. Again, you guys are doing awesome, amazing things. Um, in the rest of the time, we're gonna try to get on to the next question. So I'm gonna go on to Johnny. Uh, Johnny is a brand manager and a former agency leader working with regional and national brands. Um, Please share your perspective as a sports marketing professional. How are you defining and communicating with audiences as individuals, including people of all ages, genders, and ethnic backgrounds? I got to unmute myself, apparently. All right. um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, for me, I've, I've only been with uh, American Outlaws for about eight months, a little under eight months right now. But what is great and what I mentioned before is you know, soccer is such a diverse sport um, and our 20,000 members are of, of many diversities. And so we have a really great, uh, a lot of advocates there that will let us know and hold us accountable when we aren't uh, doing things right, including on the diversity discussion. So I think that's been a really great uh, thing for us. I think one thing I would say in regards to uh, maybe an example I can give uh, is when I first started, one of the biggest things that we weren't through was uh, designing our new member shirt. That's something uh, 20,000 of our members wear every every year. We have a new shirt that comes out. It's our biggest communications piece for, for the American Outlaws. This year, we committed ourselves in 2021 to have a shirt that's themed We the Change, uh, which is uh, a, a direct like conversation with the players who wore Be the Change across uh, their uniforms. And so we have messages of united, equality, stop racism, equal pay, and inclusion. Um, and, and that's all right there. Every day, our members put on that shirt. Well, we hope every day they put on that shirt. Uh, and and it, it speaks to the, the, the communications that we want to have um, with, with our membership and hopefully future members and future soccer fans uh, and, and U.S. soccer supporters and anyone else in that industry in the soccer world. It was designed, uh, we were very intentional about the design. It was designed by George F. Baker III, who is Nebraska born, Detroit grown, Atlanta raised, African-American illustrator and designer. And we also hired an agency called Black Arrow FC, who's focused on soccer and black culture and that intersection that that creates. And, and it's amazing how much actually Black culture has been a big part foundationally of how U.S. soccer has grown. Uh, but it's one of those untold stories. And, and working with Black Arrow to be able to tell that story through our shirt uh, with, a, again, our biggest uh, communication piece was big. Now, this was controversial 
It was a big idea. We knew it would alienate some of our members and we were fine with that because we had our leadership behind it, even though we were attacked as becoming a political organization. And, and, uh, and our leadership and our staff and our members believed that it was not political, it's, it's human. Uh, we're standing up for humans. So I guess the way we are defining that and communicating that with our audience is that we're all in. Our leadership's all in, we're ignoring the naysayers and we're saying, we are the change. We wanna be part of it. We wanna be part of it with the players. We wanna be part of it with US soccer and the soccer industry. And so I think that's the biggest thing for us. Um, we know that we owe this to our members who are gonna hold us accountable to be diverse in, in what we do and how we communicate and how our events are uh, and things like that. So uh, that kind of, hopefully that kind of answers your question, Tony, on that. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, I actually, I love it. I, I love the fact that you guys are unified in the message and you're showing that we're together in this and because that's really the, the only way that things are really gonna get done when people come together um, to, 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 to make that happen. Um, can you tell us in today's culture what, what we might be missing society when it comes to marketing and, and advertising practices? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but um, and I want to apologize in advance to Kim. Please don't uh, take any of this the wrong way. I've hired a lot of great kids from the Creative Center, so um, but I'm going to speak a little bit to hiring practices because I, I think that's what the biggest thing that's missing um, in society today amongst a lot of advertising and marketing. Uh, is, is, is thinking differently about it. Uh, many times I've heard this saying, we hire the talent pool that's available to us. And, and maybe that was right several years ago, but it's not applicable today because especially with your ability to hire remote employees worldwide, uh, certainly your ability to hire diverse talent or with diverse backgrounds, uh, that's certainly available to you now. The talent pool has expanded. Um, and so I think taking a look at hiring price uh, practices, such as eliminating the need for some roles to require college degrees. And uh, just pause on that. I know Kim maybe might be giving me some weird looks here, but well, what I'm can we totally do to focus? With you, Johnny, 100%. <laughs> All right. What if we focus more on skill set? you know, when we're looking at some of these roles? It's not to say I love college. I teach college uh, as an adjunct. I, I would love to, uh, all kids to have an opportunity to go to college. I'm all for that. But maybe there's a high school kid that's ready to contribute right now. Certainly could maybe be more of an entry level role, maybe. Uh, and maybe that's the best fit there. But then as they grow in your organization, you can offer them tuition reimbursements after maybe working for you a year in, in kind of an apprenticeship role so that they can go to college. Or maybe some of these kids don't want to go to college. And maybe it's, hey, you know, here's some money to go start your own business. It, I think entrepreneurship is something that we're not teaching enough to the advertising creative uh, uh, classes coming up. And that that's something that that is an opportunity. It's a pathway. It's certainly a pathway for those who under, are underrepresented, uh, are of low socioeconomic status to have an opportunity. And I think this could, I could go on on this forever, but if all employers started doing this, just think of all the great ideas we can come up with. So that's really something that's really of value is that all of a sudden we get this diverse, uh, all these diverse backgrounds uh, from not a ton of experience to a lot of experience working together. And I think that's what brings really great ideas and really great thoughts um, to our marketing and advertising practices. That makes that makes perfect sense, and honestly, I I completely agree with you. I know, you know, we do some stuff in advertising, but we focus more on tech. But we see the same thing with a lot of these companies, and if they're wanting to find you know skilled individuals, they're going to have to try to get other people than just individuals who just went to four-year colleges. I mean, there's other people who take different paths, and that creates that diversity that we're actually looking for. I mean, if you're bringing in the same person that has the same background, you're going to get the same thoughts, and so there's not right. much ideation there. There's not much innovation there. And so that doesn't help them down the line. And so I completely agree with that. Are there any other panelists that wanna to, wanna to add anything to those comments? I would like to jump in and just say that I, I'm totally on board with that. Working at a college, um, even the instructors we hire were held to certain teachers have to have a certain degree in order to teach at a certain level. So some of our best teachers 
were limited into the classes they could teach because they didn't have that magic piece of paper. As my students go out and they're looking for a job, um, they the, the larger the company, the more likely it is that you need to get through the gatekeeper of HR. And HR looks at a resume and looks for keywords and they look for certain things that have to be on this list that they have. And they're not looking at experience or ability or anything else. They're just looking for these keywords. So I'm, I'm totally on board with that. There is something to be said for a college degree. You learn a lot of things, you get a lot of information, you get a lot of networking, you get, there's a lot that you can garner from that, but not every kid is made for college. Not every kid should go to college. It's just not, not possible. You know, I've got multiple people in my family who had to go to college and they should go to college and they got out of high school and they went to college and they failed miserably because they just weren't ready. Um, and that's very, very, very common. And so as a society, we need to really look at what are those other answers. And Johnny mentioned apprenticeships. You know, there's other, you don't have to go to, to college to do certain roles or certain things. If you want to work with your hands, a lot of those types of jobs, apprenticeships are out there. That's learning on the job. Okay? In yeah. the advertising agency, you didn't used to have to have a college degree. You didn't have to have a bachelor degree in graphic design. We had to make that up as we went along because that wasn't a thing, right? But all of a sudden, people decided you needed that magic piece of paper. And it, and it has it's changed how we look at things. Yeah, I think for us, the entrepreneurship part of what Johnny said is really important. Um, you know, Outlook Business Solutions started out as a call center with a very traditional idea of um, butts in seats, right? Sitting on the phone, dialing numbers. And when we um, shifted focus and went more towards a marketing agency approach, um, part of the whole idea was that there were disabled workers, blind knowledge-based professionals with a lot of talent out there that one couldn't relocate or two transportation was prohibitive for them to get to a location and i remember talking to our senior leadership and saying hey look uh freelancing is is um, every marketer's gig right every writer every editor every artist has the side gig doing freelance let's just bake that into the dna for our company and um, you know, with Johnny, one of the things I'd really like to do is to, um, for our freelancers, is to help those that want to make it a business, right? So you get those that are just, hey, everybody tells me I'm a good writer. Can I write a couple of blog posts? Yeah, fine. And then you have those that this is really their bread and butter is doing freelance work, but they need to think like a business owner and not think like an employee, which is what a lot of them have been trained to do. A lot of people with disabilities as they go through the education system are trained to think more like an employee and not like an entrepreneur. And I think that's also a great connection with however size your company is, is really talking about that innovation piece and seeing, okay, if we want to talk about entrepreneurship and how that aligns with you as a person and you as a professional, but also looking into it and seeing it from a company or speaking company language and saying, okay, maybe picture this as a development opportunity. We also got to realize we want to retain that top talent within the state of Nebraska, within your company. How can we do that? And maybe it empowers them to look outside the lens, but then looking into how we need to address other areas. Like Kim was talking about, not everyone needs to go to college. My brother didn't go to college. He's doing great. How can we really embrace that, but also maybe challenge HR. I used to be an HR. I'm sorry, Kim. I used to be. Talent acquisition, I was a sorcerer, that annoying person that I messaged you on LinkedIn. That was probably me. But now I'm in my path because I kept on giving myself a chance and stepping out of my comfort zone. So I think it comes down to just having those conversations, challenging them, challenging their biases, looking at like Natalie said, was disability is being not seen or anything. We need to actually embrace that and saying start seeing it and seeing disability as not inability. They have ability. How can we embrace that? How can we captivate that? How can we look beyond just a degree? So we have actually eliminated degree, uh, uh, must have uh, bachelor degrees for a lot of our positions because we need to look into that and trying to challenge the hiring managers and the recruiters to say, what if this college individual uh, 
applied for this position. Let's see if we can actually at least get them on the phone and ask them why they applied. So we have that better understanding to deep dive bigger into their resume. Trust me, my resume ain't pretty, but I can talk. Let's have a conversation. How can I actually embrace your company culture? And for the advertisement piece, I think with, uh, I know I'm going on, but I have one last thing. One of my passions is marketing and communications. That's one of my side gigs. I love it. I am very proud of my ERGs, my employee resource groups. I'm a proud parent of an ERG. Since I'm gay, I don't have kids. I have a fur kid, but that's another story. But I kept on trying to showcase what the impact they're doing. I took photos. I posted on social media and trying to live out that culture because it wasn't being seen by my company on our website. Now I'm happy to say that my company has actually seen that and started implementing to our website and implementing to our social media platforms because they see the power that it drives, that culture that we're living out. So I just say start and see where it leads you. And I want to add just one quick piggyback on what Dan said. And that is for the advertising folks, um, the imagery of people with disabilities has got to change. Um, people with disabilities aren't the pretty people sometimes. Um, we have an HR director who was blinded by a chemical explosion and, and has burns. Um, he's not going to be your typical um, advertising image, right? But it, it is ableism and it is insulting to the disabled community to take a five foot 11, beautiful blonde white woman and put her in a wheelchair and call that representative of disabilities. Those are all, all great, great points and a great, great insight shared there. Um, unfortunately, we're, we've kind of went over time a little bit. I know there were some questions that we were trying to get to or weren't able to. Um, Alec, I don't know if you want to wrap up or if we have time to answer like number one or two of the, the questions um, from, our, from our audience. Yeah, so we have two minutes here. Uh, and, and some of the, the Q&A that occurred was for AAF specific questions. So for these, we can try to make an effort to answer those in social media. Um, as far as for some of the other questions, Anne, did you see anything come through particularly uh, that we could get answered really quick? I was just gonna look in the chat real quick. I believe there was one in the chat. Sorry, I think maybe Dan had answered it too. All right, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> you guys did awesome. <laughs> um, let's see here. No, it the looks one like that I saw was from um, Kelsey Wheeler, and she was wondering about what advantages of assembling a DE and I committee for employees as opposed to bringing in a third party consultant or um, a permanent hire. Um, if anyone wanted to speak um, in that direction and take just a couple of minutes, take just a minute there. Well, I did put the, I did respond into the chat. So if she wants to read that to be mindful, Great. that's fine. So if I, uh, I did, that. I did scan Dan's response and, and certainly agree with, um, uh, that I, I think bringing in a third party consultant or someone else is valuable, uh, especially if an organization uh, isn't educated on it, can bring a different perspective. Uh, it certainly is helpful, but also recognizing too, who do you have on your staff that's really shown that they've been uh, really committed to that? Uh, what are they doing in the community? Uh, have they been bringing up the questions over and over? Um, I think, uh, you know, making sure that that group of, of committee members isn't just like, oh, let's get all the diverse people we have and put together. Uh, let's make sure that they uh, really, really have shown that they care about not only the company, but also about bringing diversity and achieving a goal. Like having, uh, I think a lot of companies I've seen put together uh, diversity committees, but what's the goal? What's their, what's the long-term? What's the five-year plan? What's the 10-year plan? Uh, how are we, are you, are they committed to it? Um, if it's just diversity committee for the looks of it, it's, it's not gonna, uh, it's, it's not gonna really achieve much. And so I would say, I would say both. Hopefully that's, a, that's kind of a long-winded answer, Kelsey, but I think definitely third-party consultant, uh, people that are passionate about within your firm, um, and then 
uh, if maybe you don't have that or maybe you're lacking that, uh, hire people that, um, that could certainly be helpful in that area. And I think also that third person can kind of get the sense of your company culture as an outsider and maybe pinpoint key areas where you need to start and how you can build upon that, but also keep on bringing them into having those conversations, like starting with unconscious bias or hidden bias. Everyone has one, but you need to, you need to know that you do have a bias and how we can move forward from there and take baby steps. It's an ongoing journey. It's not going to be a check off the box and one and done like, okay, we have diversity marketing check. No, it's an ongoing journey with every different segment. No, I definitely appreciate that. I'll go ahead and let Alec wrap up because I know we're just about out of time. No, yeah, no. And, and thank you guys so much. Uh, you know, an hour doesn't do this conversation justice. There's a lot here. Um, everyone's really passionate about it. Uh, and certainly we're going to commit ourselves to having more of these in the future. So, you know, thank you, Tony, Dan, Natalie, Kim, Johnny, for taking time today to join us for our Ad Connect conversations. Your thought leadership in today's session has been valuable for all of us. Uh, as you know, we work to achieve inclusive outcomes in the work we produce in our, in our personal lives and in our workplaces. AAF Omaha's board of directors and membership team has been working to bring creative events, conferences, and new special events along with webinars to virtual programming to benefit our members. Speaking of member benefits, we have two member perks to award today to AAF Omaha members. Ray Dotzler and Sarah Sims, you have both won a $10 gift card to be used at Village Point thanks to our member perk programs at Red Development. Ray and Sarah, your gift cards will be mailed to you. We would like to thank our elite sponsors and members from Centro and Woodman Life for their generosity to AAF Omaha throughout the year. And thank you to Clark Creative Group, today's program sponsor. Ad Reads AAF Omaha's virtual book club and happy hour is scheduled for May 13th. The event is free to our members and guests. The featured book for discussion is Juicing the Orange, How to Turn Creativity into a Power Business Advantage. Our next professional panel discussion is on May 18th, State of Digital Media. During this panel discussion, attendees will learn about the trends with digital media, especially in cookie-less world how a cookie-less world will affect business and consumers and will, what changes will need to be made. On June 29th, we'll be hosting a panel on the state of social media, market calendars for on-brand to be held July 15th, registration materials, speakers lists, and agendas will be available soon for this virtual full day event hosted by AAF, PRSA, AIGA, and AMA. Thanks again to Tony, Dan, Kim, Natalie, and Johnny. And to our sponsor, Centro Woodlife, Woodman Life and Clark Creative Group for joining us for today's Ad Connect. Thank everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending. And if you want to share this with somebody, this is cloud recorded. We appreciate it and have a great day. Thank you. We're going to have everyone stick around for just a minute. We'll get a quick picture. Excellent work, guys. You guys did awesome. That was so informative. I apologize for not. Uh keeping the time a little bit better, but. No, you guys, there, so. you guys did great. It's hard to like put a time, you know, when there's just good conversation.